Welcome to Monster Madness, where nightmares come to life. Here, in the shadowed corners of the world, monsters lurk, waiting for the moment you least expect. These are not just stories, they are whispers of what hides in the darkness, what claws at the edges of your sanity, and what waits beneath your bed. Remember, once you enter Monster Madness, there's no turning back. Hello, creatures of the night, and welcome back to another spine-tingling episode of Monster Madness, where the shadows come alive and the whispers of the unknown send shivers down your spine. Before we get too far into the video, go ahead and give this video a thumbs up and click that subscribe button. All my rowdy friends and I have a nice video for you tonight, so go ahead and dim your lights, lock your doors, and prepare yourself for a tale that will haunt your dreams. We had been planning the trip for months, eager for a break from our hectic lives. The idea was simple. A long weekend at an Airbnb nestled in the mountains, far from the city's endless noise. There were four of us. Me, my girlfriend Mia, and our best friends, Jake and Sarah. We'd known each other for years, and this getaway seemed like the perfect opportunity to unwind, reconnect, and escape the daily grind. The Airbnb listing had promised seclusion, serenity, and nature at our doorstep. It was a cozy cabin, built decades ago but well-maintained, with a wide porch that overlooked a dense forest. The photographs showed towering trees, their leaves golden and red a sign that autumn was in full swing. We were all excited. Who wouldn't be? A chance to disconnect from our phones and reconnect with each other. The drive up took most of the afternoon, and as we climbed higher into the mountains, the landscape grew more wild and remote. Civilization faded behind us, replaced by endless rows of trees that seemed to close in on the narrow road. By the time we arrived, the sun was dipping low on the horizon, casting long shadows across the gravel driveway. The cabin was just as charming as the photos had suggested, if not more so. It stood at the edge of the forest with a small clearing around it. The wood was weathered but sturdy, the porch creaking pleasantly under our feet as we unloaded the car. The air was crisp, carrying the earthy scent of fallen leaves and pine. We spent the first few hours settling in. That Mia and Sarah immediately claimed the kitchen, whipping up a hearty dinner while Jake and I brought in the bags and explored the cabin. It was rustic but comfortable, with a stone fireplace, soft, worn furniture, and large windows that framed the surrounding forest. The rooms were small but cozy, each with a view of the woods. As the smell of roasting chicken filled the cabin, the place felt like a home away from home. The room fell silent for a moment, the crackling fire the only sound. I tried to shake off the uneasy feeling Sarah's story had left me with, reminding myself that it was just that, a story. But still, the idea of something out there in the woods, watching us, made my skin crawl. Jake eventually broke the tension with a laugh. Come on guys, we're here to relax, not scare ourselves to death. Let's call it a night. We agreed, though the mood had shifted. The laughter and lightness from earlier had given way to a strange, uneasy silence. We all headed to our respective rooms, the hallway lit only by the dim glow of the fire behind us. As Mia and I settled into bed, I couldn't help but glance out the window at the dark woods beyond. The trees stood tall and silent, their branches swaying gently in the breeze. But there was something unsettling about the way the shadows seemed to move, as if the forest itself was alive and watching. Mia must have sensed my unease, because she reached out and took my hand, her touch warm and reassuring. It's just a story, she whispered, her breath soft against my ear. Try not to think about it. I nodded, squeezing her hand. But as I drifted off to sleep, I couldn't shake the feeling that something was out there, lurking in the darkness. I woke to the sound of footsteps. At first, I thought I was dreaming. The rhythmic crunch of gravel outside 
moving steadily closer, seemed too real to be a figment of my imagination. My heart pounded as I lay there, trying to determine if it was just my mind playing tricks on me. But the sound continued, slow and deliberate, as if someone, or something, was circling the cabin. I glanced over at Mia, who was still asleep beside me, her breathing soft and steady. I didn't want to wake her, not if it was nothing. But the longer I listened, the more certain I became that someone was outside. Carefully, I slipped out of bed, doing my best not to make a sound. The floorboards creaked under my feet as I made my way to the window. I pulled back the curtain just enough to peer outside. The moonlight cast long shadows across the clearing, but I couldn't see anyone. The forest loomed just beyond the edge of the yard, the trees swaying gently in the wind. I held my breath, scanning the area for any movement. But there was nothing, only the eerie stillness of the night. I was about to let the curtain fall back when I saw it. A figure standing at the edge of the woods, just barely visible in the darkness. My heart skipped a beat, and I squinted, trying to make out any details. The figure was tall and thin, its outline blurred by the shadows. It didn't move, didn't make a sound. It just stood there, staring at the cabin. For a moment, I thought it might be Jake or Sarah, maybe playing a prank. But something about the way it stood, so still and unnatural, made my blood run cold. I blinked, and in that instant, the figure was gone. I let the curtain fall back, my hands shaking. What the hell was that? I told myself it was just my imagination, that I was still half asleep and seeing things that weren't there. But I couldn't shake the feeling that something was very, very wrong. I crawled back into bed, careful not to wake Mia. But sleep didn't come easily. I lay there for hours, staring up at the ceiling, listening for any sound that might indicate someone, or something, was outside. But the night remained silent, and eventually, exhaustion took over. When I woke the next morning, the sun was streaming in through the window, casting a warm glow across the room. For a moment, the events of the night before felt like a distant memory, something I could easily dismiss as a dream. But the uneasy feeling lingered, gnawing at the back of my mind. As me and I made our way to the kitchen, we found Jake and Sarah already there, coffee in hand. They looked up as we entered, and I could tell by their expressions that they hadn't slept well either. Did anyone else hear something last night? Jake asked, his voice tense. Like, footsteps outside? My heart skipped a beat, so I hadn't imagined it. Yeah, I said slowly. I heard it too, and I saw someone, something, standing by the edge of the woods. Sarah's face went pale. Are you sure? I nodded. I don't know what it was, but it was just standing there watching. But Mia and Sarah exchanged nervous glances, and Jake frowned, rubbing the back of his neck. Could it have been an animal? He suggested, though he didn't sound convinced. Maybe, I replied, though deep down I knew it wasn't. But whatever it was, it didn't look right. It was too tall, too still. We sat in silence for a moment, the tension in the room thickening. None of us wanted to say what we were all thinking. That Sarah's story might not have been just a story after all. Eventually, Mia broke the silence. Maybe we should go for a hike, she suggested, her voice a little too cheerful. Get some fresh air and clear our heads. It wasn't a bad idea. Maybe getting out of the cabin, out of our heads, would help us shake off the unease that had settled over us. We agreed to go though I couldn't help but feel a twinge of apprehension as we laced up our boots and prepared to head into the woods. The trail wound through the forest, a narrow path of dirt and leaves that crunched underfoot. The air was cool, filled with the scent of pine and earth. The sun filtered through the trees in golden beams, casting long shadows across the ground. It should have been peaceful, even idyllic, but the tension from the cabin had followed us into the woods, hanging over us like a dark cloud. 
We walked in silence for a while, each of us lost in our own thoughts. The only sounds were the rustling of leaves and the occasional call of a bird in the distance. But even those sounds felt muted, as if the forest itself was holding its breath. Do you think it's possible? Sarah asked quietly, breaking the silence. That there's something out here, I mean. Something not human? Jake sighed, running a hand through his hair. I don't know. It's hard to believe. But after last night, he trailed off, and we all knew what he meant. The figure I'd seen, the footsteps we'd heard, none of it made sense. Not in any rational way. But that didn't make it any less real. I just want to understand what we're dealing with, I said, my voice low. If it's an animal, fine. We can handle that. But if it's something else, Mia squeezed my hand, her grip tight. We'll figure it out, she said, though her voice was tinged with uncertainty. We just need to stay together and be careful. We continued walking, the path winding deeper into the forest. The trees grew denser, their branches intertwining overhead, blocking out the sunlight. The further we went, the darker it became, until it felt like we were walking through a tunnel of shadows. We reached a small clearing, where the trees parted to reveal a patch of sky. In the center of the clearing was an old, gnarled tree, its trunk twisted and blackened, as if it had been struck by lightning. The ground around it was bare, the grass dead and brittle. I don't like this place, Mia whispered, her eyes fixed on the tree. It feels wrong, I agreed. There was something about the clearing that made my skin crawl, an oppressive atmosphere that seemed to suck the air out of my lungs. Let's keep moving, Jake suggested, and we were all too eager to comply. As we turned to leave the clearing, I heard it again, the sound of footsteps, this time behind us. I froze, my heart leaping into my throat. The others must have heard it too because they stopped, their eyes wide with fear. Slowly, I turned around, scanning the trees for any sign of movement. But there was nothing, just the silent, looming forest. Did you hear that? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. Yeah, Jake replied, his face pale. It's close. We stood there, waiting, listening. The footsteps came again, closer this time, followed by a low, guttural growl that seemed to vibrate through the air. My blood turned to ice. What the hell is that? Sarah whispered, her voice trembling. I didn't have an answer. All I knew was that we needed to get out of there, and fast. Run, I said, my voice tight with fear. Now, we bolted, sprinting down the path as fast as we could. The forest seemed to close in around us, the shadows growing darker and more menacing with each step. The growling grew louder, closer, as if whatever was following us was right on our heels. I didn't dare look back, focusing only on the path ahead. My lungs burned, my legs screaming in protest, but I didn't stop. I couldn't stop. We burst out of the trees and into the clearing around the cabin, gasping for breath. I spun around, expecting to see something, anything, emerge from the woods behind us. But there was nothing. The forest was silent the only sound our ragged breathing. What? What was that? Mia panted, her face pale with fear. I don't know, I replied, my heart still racing. But we need to get inside. Now, we rushed up the porch steps and into the cabin, slamming the door behind us. I locked it, my hands shaking, then checked the windows to make sure they were secure. The others did the same moving quickly through the cabin to make sure every door and window was locked tight. Once we were sure we were safe, we gathered in the living room, the tension thick enough to cut with a knife. No one spoke for a long time, each of us trying to process what had just happened. Finally, Jake broke the silence. We need to leave, now. I nodded, though I wasn't sure where we would go. We were miles from the nearest town, with no cell service, and no way to call for help. But staying here, in the heart of the forest, felt like a death sentence. 
We'll pack up and leave first thing in the morning, I said, my voice firm. We'll drive until we find somewhere safe. The others nodded in agreement, though the fear in their eyes told me they weren't convinced we'd make it through the night. The sun had set by the time we finished packing, leaving the cabin bathed in darkness. We lit every lamp we could find, filling the small space with warm, flickering light. But the shadows still loomed at the edges of the room, and every creak and groan of the old wood set my nerves on edge. We huddled together in the living room, too afraid to be alone. The fire crackled in the hearth, casting dancing shadows on the walls. But the warmth and light did little to ease the fear that had taken hold of us. I kept my eyes on the windows, watching for any sign of movement outside. The figure I'd seen the night before haunted my thoughts, and I couldn't shake the feeling that it was still out there, watching us. As the hours ticked by, the tension grew unbearable. Every little noise set us on edge. The wind rustling the trees, the crack of a branch, the howl of a distant animal. But nothing came for us, and eventually, Exhaustion began to set in. Mia leaned against me, her eyes heavy with sleep. Maybe we should try to get some rest, she murmured. Though I could tell she wasn't convinced it was a good idea. I nodded, though I knew I wouldn't be able to sleep. Yeah, let's try. We decided to stay together, in the living room. Each of us taking turns to keep watch. Jake volunteered to go first, and I reluctantly agreed though the thought of closing my eyes made my stomach turn. Pamia and Sarah curled up on the couch, while I stretched out on the floor, my back against the wall. I kept my eyes on the fire, watching the flames flicker and dance, until, finally, my eyelids grew heavy, and I drifted off into a fitful sleep. I woke to the sound of whispering. At first, I thought it was part of a dream. The soft, urgent voices, blending with the crackling of the fire. But, as I came fully awake, I realized the voices were real, and they were coming from outside. I sat up, my heart pounding, and saw Jake standing by the window, his back to us. His head was tilted to the side, as if he was listening to something just beyond the glass. Jake? I whispered, trying not to wake the others. What are you doing? He didn't respond. The whispering grew louder more insistent, but I still couldn't make out the words. It was like a chorus of voices, all speaking at once, just beyond the edge of hearing. I got to my feet, moving toward him slowly. Jake, what's going on? He turned to face me, and my blood turned to ice. His eyes, normally a warm brown, were pitch black, reflecting the flickering light of the fire. His face was pale, his expression blank, as if he was in a trance. Before I could react, he reached out and grabbed my arm, his grip like iron. Come with me, he whispered, his voice strange and hollow. They're waiting for us. I yanked my arm free, stumbling back in terror. Jake, snap out of it! But he didn't respond. Instead, he turned back to the window, his gaze fixed on something I couldn't see. The whispering grew louder filling the room, until it felt like the voices were inside my head, clawing at my thoughts. Jake, stop. I shouted, desperate to break whatever hold was on him. At the sound of my voice, Mia and Sarah jerked awake, their eyes wide with fear. What's happening? Mia asked, her voice trembling. I don't know, I replied, my heart racing. But we need to get out of here. Now, before we could move, Jake suddenly lunged for the door, throwing it open with a force that sent it crashing against the wall. Cold air rushed into the cabin, extinguishing the fire and plunging us into darkness. Jake, no, Sarah screamed, scrambling to her feet. But he was already gone, disappearing into the night. We ran after him, stumbling out into the clearing. The moon hung high in the sky, casting an eerie light over the cabin and the surrounding woods. I could just make out Jake's figure, running toward the trees, his movements jerky and unnatural. Jake, stop, I shouted, but he didn't slow down. We chased after him, the cold night air burning our lungs. 
The whispering had followed us outside, growing louder with each step. It was everywhere, surrounding us, pressing in from all sides. Jake reached the edge of the woods and disappeared into the darkness. We skidded to a stop, too terrified to follow him in. What do we do? Mia asked, her voice barely above a whisper. I don't know, I replied, my mind racing. We couldn't just leave him out there, but the thought of entering those woods, especially after what we'd seen and heard, filled me with dread. Before we could make a decision, the whispering suddenly stopped. The night grew eerily silent, as if the forest itself was holding its breath. And then we heard it, a blood-curdling scream, echoing through the trees. It was Jake. Without thinking, I ran into the woods, the others close behind me. The trees loomed tall and dark, their branches clawing at us as we pushed through the underbrush. The scream came again, closer this time, followed by a low guttural growl that made my blood run cold. We burst into a small clearing, and there, in the center, was Jake. He was standing with his back to us, his body unnaturally still. The moonlight filtered through the trees, casting an eerie glow over the scene. Jake? Sarah called out, her voice trembling. He turned slowly to face us, and my heart skipped a beat. His eyes were still black, his face pale and emotionless. But it wasn't just his eyes that were wrong. His entire body seemed off, like a puppet on strings, moved by some unseen force. Jake, what's going on? I asked, my voice shaking. He didn't respond. Instead, he took a slow step toward us, his movements jerky and unnatural. The growling grew louder, as if it was coming from within him, and I realized with horror that whatever was standing in front of us wasn't Jake. Run, I whispered, but the others were already backing away, their faces pale with fear. We turned and fled back toward the cabin, the thing that looked like Jake, following us at a terrifying speed. The whispering had returned, louder than ever, filling my head with a cacophony of voices that made it impossible to think. We reached the cabin and slammed the door behind us, locking it as fast as we could. I grabbed a chair and wedged it under the doorknob, hoping it would be enough to keep whatever was out there from getting in. We huddled together in the center of the room, our hearts pounding in unison. The whispering grew louder, surrounding us, until it felt like the walls were closing in. And then, just as suddenly as it had started, the whispering stopped. The silence was deafening, broken only by our ragged breathing. We waited, our ears straining for any sound that might indicate that the thing outside had gone. But there was nothing, just the eerily stillness of the night. What do we do now? Mia whispered, her voice trembling. I didn't have an answer. We were trapped, with no way to call for help, and no idea what we were up against. All we could do was wait and hope that whatever was out there would lose interest and leave us alone. Hours passed, and the tension in the room became unbearable. Every creak of the cabin, every rustle of the wind outside, set us on edge. But the thing that had taken Jake didn't return, and eventually, exhaustion began to take over. We took turns keeping watch, though none of us could fully relax. The fear had burrowed deep into our bones, making it impossible to sleep. We sat in silence, the only sound the ticking of the clock on the mantel marking the slow passage of time. When dawn finally broke, the first rays of sunlight streaming through the windows, we knew we had to leave. There was no question about it now. This place was cursed, haunted by something far more dangerous than we could have ever imagined. We packed our bags in a hurry, throwing everything into the car without a second thought. The sun was rising, casting a warm golden light over the forest, but it did nothing to ease the fear that had taken root in our hearts. As we piled into the car, I glanced back at the cabin one last time. The door hung open, the chair we'd wedged under the doorknob lying broken on the floor. 
The windows were shattered, the glass sparkling like diamonds in the morning light. And there, standing at the edge of the woods, was Jake, or what used to be Jake. He watched us in silence, his black eyes glinting in the sunlight. For a moment, I thought I saw a flicker of recognition, a glimpse of the friend we had lost. But then the figure turned and disappeared into the trees, leaving us with nothing but the memory of his haunting, empty gaze. We didn't speak as we drove away, the car speeding down the winding mountain road. The forest loomed on either side, the trees casting long shadows across the asphalt. The whispering had stopped, but the echo of those voices lingered in my mind, a constant reminder of the nightmare we had barely escaped. We never spoke of what happened during that trip. When we finally reached the safety of the city, we went our separate ways, each of us trying to forget the horrors we had witnessed. But the memory of that weekend haunted me, a dark shadow that followed me wherever I went. Sometimes, late at night, I would wake up to the sound of footsteps outside my window, slow and deliberate. I would lie there, my heart pounding, listening as they moved closer and closer. But when I gathered the courage to look outside, there would be nothing. Only the dark, silent trees swaying in the wind. But I knew better. I knew that somewhere out there, deep in the heart of the forest, something was still watching, still waiting. And one day, it might come for me too. Welcome to Monster Madness, where nightmares come to life. Here, in the shadowed corners of the world, monsters lurk, waiting for the moment you least expect. These are not just stories, they are whispers of what hides in the darkness, what claws at the edges of your sanity, and what waits beneath your bed. Remember, once you enter Monster Madness, there's no turning back. Hello, creatures of the night, and welcome back to another spine-tingling episode of Monster Madness, where the shadows come alive and the whispers of the unknown send shivers down your spine. Before we get too far into the video, go ahead and give this video a thumbs up and click that subscribe button. All my rowdy friends and I have a nice video for you tonight, so go ahead and dim your lights, lock your doors, and prepare yourself for a tale that will haunt your dreams. I'm writing this as a warning to anyone who thinks about renting a secluded Airbnb in the middle of nowhere. I know these places can be tempting, a chance to escape the daily grind, breathe in fresh air, and disconnect from the chaos of city life. That's what we thought too. But we were wrong. Dead wrong. It was supposed to be the perfect getaway. Just me, my girlfriend Amanda, and our closest friends, Chris and Liz. We'd all been friends since college, and as the years passed, we started to drift apart, caught up in work, relationships, and all the responsibilities that come with adulthood. So when Chris suggested we rent an Airbnb for a weekend retreat, we jumped at the chance. We found this charming cabin on the edge of a dense forest, far away from civilization. The pictures were stunning. A rustic wooden house with a wraparound porch, a fire pit out front, and a view of the mountains that looked like something out of a postcard. The reviews were all positive, and the owner, some guy named Richard, assured us that we'd have the place to ourselves. We set out early on a Friday morning, the excitement palpable in the car. It was autumn, and the trees were bursting with color, reds, oranges, and yellows that made the drive feel like a journey into some kind of fairy tale. We made good time, and by the afternoon, we were winding our way up a narrow road that led deeper into the mountains. The air grew cooler, crisper, and the trees seemed to close in around us as we climbed higher. The GPS signal started to fade, and we nearly missed the turnoff to the cabin, a dirt path that was barely visible from the road. We followed it for about a mile until the trees parted, revealing the cabin just as it had been in the photos. It was even more beautiful in person, surrounded by towering pines and perched on the edge of a steep drop that overlooked the forest below. We unloaded the car, stretching our legs and breathing in the fresh mountain air. The silence was striking. Not a car, not a plane, nothing but the rustling of leaves and the distant call of a bird. 
It was perfect. We spent the first evening settling in, getting the fire started, and cracking open a few beers. The cabin was cozy, with a large stone fireplace, comfy furniture, and a kitchen stocked with everything we needed. The four of us had planned a big dinner, grilled steaks, roasted vegetables, and more than enough wine to keep the good times rolling. As the sun set behind the mountains, the place took on a warm, inviting glow. We sat around the table, laughing, reminiscing about old times, and enjoying the feeling of being together again. After dinner, we moved to the porch, wrapping ourselves in blankets as the temperature dropped. The fire pit crackled, sending sparks up into the night sky, and the stars came out in full force, brighter than any of us had ever seen. There wasn't a cloud in sight, just a vast, starry sky that seemed to stretch on forever. It was one of those moments where everything feels right in the world, where you forget all your worries and just live in the moment. But then, out of nowhere, we heard it. At first, it was just a faint noise, barely audible over the crackling fire and our own chatter. A low, rhythmic thumping sound, like something heavy hitting the ground over and over again. We all stopped talking, straining our ears to catch it. Did you hear that? Liz asked, her voice barely above a whisper. Yeah, Chris replied, his brow furrowing. What the hell is that? We all listened, the sound growing louder, closer. It was coming from the forest, from somewhere deep in the trees. It wasn't an animal. It was too deliberate, too human. The rhythmic thumping was soon accompanied by another noise, something even more unsettling. A wet, squelching sound, like something being dragged through the dirt. A chill ran down my spine, and I looked at Amanda, who was staring wide-eyed into the darkness. Maybe it's just some animal, I suggested, though I didn't believe it myself. An animal dragging something? Chris asked, shaking his head. I don't think so, man. The sounds continued, growing louder with each passing moment. They were getting closer, whatever it was, and I could feel the hairs on the back of my neck standing on end. Finally, Liz broke the silence. I think we should go inside. None of us argued. We hurried into the cabin, locking the door behind us. The fire in the pit outside crackled and popped, but it did nothing to dispel the growing sense of unease that had settled over us. The thumping and dragging noises were now accompanied by something even more terrifying. A low, guttural growl that seemed to echo through the trees. What the hell is that? Amanda asked, her voice trembling. I don't know, I admit it, my mind racing. I didn't want to scare anyone, but the truth was, I was terrified. I'd never heard anything like it before, and I had no idea what we were dealing with. We all stood there in the living room staring at the door, waiting for something to happen. The noises outside were growing louder, closer, and it felt like whatever it was out there was coming straight for us. And then, just as suddenly as it had started, it stopped. The silence that followed was deafening, and we all held our breath, waiting, listening. Seconds passed, then minutes. Nothing. No more thumping, no more dragging, no more growling. Just the crackling of the fire outside and the distant sound of the wind in the trees. I think it's gone, Chris said finally, his voice shaky. We all breathed a sigh of relief, but the tension in the room didn't dissipate. The fear lingered, hanging in the air like a thick fog. None of us knew what to say, what to do. Finally, Liz suggested we go to bed, try to get some sleep, and forget about whatever had just happened. None of us liked the idea of splitting up, but we were too tired to argue. We locked all the doors, checked the windows, and went to our separate rooms. Amanda and I lay in bed, staring up at the ceiling, too afraid to close our eyes. Every creak, every rustle of the wind outside sent my heart racing, and I knew I wasn't going to sleep that night. Sometime in the early hours of the morning, I must have drifted off because I woke with a start to the sound of something scratching at the window. It was a soft, scraping sound, almost like fingernails on glass. My heart leapt into my throat, and I sat up in bed, listening. Amanda, I whispered, shaking her awake. Do you hear that? She groaned softly, rubbing her eyes as she sat up. Hear what? Listen. The scratching had stopped, but the tension in the room was palpable. 
We sat there in the darkness, straining our ears, and then we heard it again. A faint, dragging sound, like something being pulled across the ground just outside our window. Holy shit, Amanda whispered, her voice trembling. What is that? I don't know, I replied, my voice barely audible. But we need to get out of here. We grabbed our phones, tiptoeing to the door as quietly as we could. The cabin was eerily silent, the only sound the soft creaking of the floorboards under our feet. We made our way to the living room, where Chris and Liz were already waiting, their faces pale and drawn. You heard it too? Chris asked, his voice shaky. Yeah, I replied. We need to get out of here. Now. But as I reached for the front door, I froze. The door was already open, just a crack, but enough to send a cold gust of wind through the room. My heart pounded in my chest, and I slowly pushed the door open, peering outside. The fire in the pit was nothing but glowing embers now, casting a dim light across the porch. But what caught my attention wasn't the fire. It was the trail of blood that led from the forest, across the yard, and up the steps to the porch. It was thick and dark, staining the wooden planks, and it disappeared into the darkness beyond the edge of the porch. Jesus Christ, Chris whispered, his voice barely audible. What the hell happened here? I didn't answer. I couldn't tear my eyes away from the trail of blood. I followed it with my gaze, trying to make sense of what I was seeing, and then I saw it, a dark shape, lying motionless on the ground just beyond the reach of the firelight. It was large, human-shaped, but something was wrong. The proportions were all off, the limbs twisted and bent at unnatural angles. We need to go, Amanda said, her voice trembling. I nodded, taking a step back, my mind racing. But as I turned to go, something moved in the darkness beyond the porch. A soft rustling sound, like leaves being stirred by the wind. I froze, my heart hammering in my chest, and slowly turned back to look. At first, I couldn't see anything, just shadows shifting in the dim light. But then, I saw it. A pair of eyes, glowing faintly in the darkness, watching us from the edge of the forest. They were too high off the ground, too far apart to belong to any animal I knew of, and they were fixed on us with an intensity that sent a wave of fear through my entire body. Get in the car, I whispered, my voice shaking. Now. We bolted for the door, slamming it shut behind us as we raced to the car. Chris fumbled with the keys, his hands shaking so badly he could barely get them into the ignition. The engine roared to life, and we tore out of the driveway, the tires skidding on the gravel as we sped down the narrow road. We didn't stop, didn't look back. The forest closed in around us as we hurtled down the winding road, the trees blurring past in a dark, twisted mass. No one spoke. The only sound was the roar of the engine and the pounding of my heart. After what felt like an eternity, we finally reached the main road. The GPS signal came back, and we followed it until we saw the lights of a small town in the distance. We pulled into a gas station, finally feeling safe enough to stop. We sat there in the car, catching our breath, trying to make sense of what had just happened. What the hell was that? Liz asked, her voice trembling. I don't know, I replied, my voice hollow but I'm never going back there. We spent the rest of the night in a motel, huddled together in a single room, too afraid to be alone. None of us slept, the images of what we'd seen burned into our minds. We checked out the next morning and drove home in silence, each of us lost in our own thoughts. A few days later, I got a call from the Airbnb host, Richard. He was friendly, as he had been before our stay, but there was something different in his voice, attention that hadn't been there before. Hey, just wanted to check in, he said, his tone casual but strained. Did you guys have a good time? I hesitated, unsure of what to say. We, we left early. Oh, any particular reason? He tried to sound curious, but there was an edge to his voice. I didn't want to go into details. We just didn't feel comfortable staying there. There was a long pause on the other end of the line. I see, he finally said, his voice flat. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. I hope you'll consider staying with us again. I didn't reply, just muttered something about needing to go and hung up the phone. 
I couldn't shake the feeling that Richard knew more than he was letting on, that he was hiding something about that cabin. I went online later that day, intending to leave a review to warn others about what we'd experienced. But when I pulled up the listing, it was gone. Not just unavailable, completely erased, like it had never existed. There was no trace of the cabin, no sign that it had ever been listed. I tried looking up the address, but it was as if the cabin didn't exist. The road we'd taken wasn't on any map I could find, and when I called the local authorities to inquire about the area, they said there was nothing up there. No houses, no cabins, just untouched forest for miles. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. How could a place just disappear? How could there be no record of it, no sign that it had ever been there? But the more I searched, the more it became clear that the cabin had been wiped from existence, like some kind of bad dream that we'd all shared. To this day, I don't know what we encountered in those woods. Was it a person? An animal? Something else entirely? All I know is that it wasn't natural, and it wasn't something that belonged in this world. We were lucky to get out of there alive, and I'll never forget the terror of that night. The glowing eyes in the darkness, the twisted shape lying in the yard, the trail of blood leading back to the forest. So if you ever find yourself tempted to rent a remote cabin, far away from civilization, think twice. You never know what might be lurking out there in the shadows, waiting for someone foolish enough to wander too close. And whatever you do, if you hear something in the night, thumping, dragging, growling, don't go outside. Don't investigate. Just run. Run as fast as you can and don't look back. Because sometimes, the monsters are real. And sometimes, they're closer than you think.